So one of the things I didn't talk about with the BCHA in our research is I started a couple years ago now, I think. <laughs> we have been working on trying to bring together an academic volume of writing on secularism and non-religion and atheism and humanism, activism and research in Canada. Some of this is a way to just put our own work into a book, uh, but it's also a way to connect with the broader research community that we've been slowly connecting with as we've gotten some of our work actually academically published. And as we were working on this, we thought it would be great to involve a number of personal stories of activists in the country who have approached non-religion or secularism in different ways. And one of the people we came across was Paul. Paul lived and still lives out in the Fraser Valley and was the editor of the Chilliwack Times and had been working at that paper for 15 plus years. He started as a reporter, worked his way all the way up to be editor, and he ruffled feathers out there. He was a constant critic of the religious rights influence and really tightened the screws in terms of making sure that the coverage was critical and, you know, honest and fair of the influence of those communities in politics at the school boards and municipal councils. And that didn't make him a lot of friends, I take it, because uh, about a year ago, Paul actually lost his job. He was fired as editor of the Chilliwack Times following an ill-fated tweet, but it seemed like that was more the straw that broke the camel's back in terms of his job, but I'm sure he can get into that directly. So Paul is going to have his full story told in our book if and when it eventually gets published. Teal is currently shopping it around to publishers and we're hoping we get some positive uh, movement on that. But if not, at very least, we'll talk about it today and we will find a way to get Paul's story out there because uh, I suspect it'll be quite interesting to everyone. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I just, I'm really happy to, to be talking to you, to you guys and see all this. I feel almost like like giddy embarrassingly because I don't I don't have I've not been part of this group or part of this world and you guys are great just hearing some of the stuff you say I was gonna say I want into this club but I did join a couple of days ago I don't know what took me so long so <laughs> um uh not sure it took me so long uh, after all these years uh, and I love the reality based community that's great one of one of, we, one of you was mentioning uh fictions and uh, and I love that because I'm a big uh, Yuval Noah Harari fan, and he talks about uh, Homo sapiens evolved in our civilizations, um, became civilizations thanks to agreed upon fictions. Once we had language, we got to agreed upon fictions such as uh, empires and laws and money and religion, and, and that's that's how that's how civilizations were formed. So anyway, that's just off the top of my head. That's just. Uh, but I'll give a quick uh, quick bio. My name is Paul Henderson. I am a recovering journalist, I like to say. Um, I was uh, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic for far too long. Uh, I, I caught the last lifeboat a year ago. Um, I now work for the provincial government, actually, as an editor in the communications department. Uh, I'm also a technical writer uh, for an architectural firm, and I'm working on a few other writing freelance projects. Uh, not freelance, but a writing project, of course, is this one with Teal, which is, I've always said, if this never gets published, I honestly don't even care because this is this forced me to write my own story. I've always been a journalist. I kept journals. And so making me write this story this way and getting feedback is fabulous. So literally, if no one ever reads this, I don't even care. Well, yeah, <laughs> Teal read it. So, um, uh, and yeah, just while you, again, while you guys were talking, just some amazing stuff came up. It just reminded me of the fact that I, I have another thing I was working on that I don't have time for is, is there's a guy who lives in Chilliwack named Jerry Armstrong, who, who, uh, in the 1970s was literally at the right hand of L. Ron Hubbard on the Sea Org. And he was, he was there and he was, um, at one point, they, they was getting a lot of bad, more and more bad media they were getting in the late 70s. And there was an advice, he advised them to write a biography and they agreed. And Jerry was tasked with compiling the research for the biography, not writing it, compiling the research. And the more and more he found, the more and more research he found, the more and more he found that everything L. Ron Hubbard said was a lie. And he assumed, well, he was a big, he was a, he was a hardcore Scientologist. So everything he, he assumed he was wrong. He FOI'd thousands and thousands of documents. And sure enough, over and over and over again, found out everything L. Ron Hubbard said over the years about his background was a lie. 
so he fled with his documents and he he fled to Canada and Chilliwack and they've been pursuing him with lawsuits, suing him for 50 years. Every time he opens his mouth, uh, I think it's like ten thousand dollars. He's fine, just something like that. He owes millions of dollars to the government, some some court in California, and and yeah, the files right next to me. And here's like a an ex parte warrant of arrest. If he ever shows up in California, they will arrest him. Anyway, this is a guy who lives in Chilliwack, and he wants me to write his story. And I'm like, oh my god, this is like incredible. But I just never had had time for it. So anyway, that's an anecdote I did not plan on talking about, but just hearing you guys reminded me about it. So, um. So yeah, for 16 years, I worked at the Chilliwack Times and the Chilliwack Progress, I should say. You mentioned the Times, but it was the Progress at the end because uh, 13 years I was a reporter, final three as editor of the Chilliwack Progress until I was fired with cause on June 2nd, 2023, after a series of tweets I, I, I sent out on June 1st, um, ostensibly in support of first responders after the near drowning of a three-year-old uh, boy. Um, they were, I admit, they were insensitive. They were ill-timed, uh, but they also they also kind of mocked the efficacy of prayer to bring about results in the real world. So um, I like to say that I crossed a literally sacred line in the Eastern Fraser Valley, um, or uh, to use uh, Ian's metaphor, it was the straw that broke the atheist back or something like that. Um, Chilliwack, or the Eastern Fraser Valley is often called the Bible Belt of BC. I think that's overstated, frankly, and it's changing a lot, but i would come to that. Um, and if Abbotsford was the buckle of the Bible Belt, Chilliwack is the, the first notch. Um, there is an expression in Chilliwack uh, you aren't really allowed to say. It's kind of a joke. It's always been a joke, and it's the, it's the Dutch Mafia. The Dutch Mafia run this town, and they'll, you know, take you down. And of course, there's no real such thing as the Dutch Mafia, but they took me down. So more and more on that, a little bit of that later. So um, I will say quickly that I did file a lawsuit for wrongful dismissal. And my lawyer also filed a complaint with the BC Human Rights Tribunal on religious grounds. It had never occurred to me in the past that someone could be discriminated against for religious reasons for having no religion at all. Of course you can. <laughs> um, all of that made me slightly uncomfortable because I ironically as a strong advocate of freedom of expression, which I was defending, too often, in my opinion, I've seen frivolous lawsuits filed over what seems like hurt feelings, frankly, and nothing much more. But, you know, I, I had a I had a valid claim, according to everybody I talked to. So, um, um, and six months later, and maybe this isn't nice, but hopefully many, many thousands of dollars spent on their part, they did settle with me. Um, I won't say any more about that. Uh, the settlement did not include a non-disclosure clause. Uh, I do have a non-disparagement clause, which is interesting. So I will only say that Black Press is managed by fabulous human beings who I greatly admire from top to bottom, everyone. Um, tiny bit about me. I'm from Oakville, Ontario. I have an honors BA in philosophy from the University of Western Ontario. Spent nine seasons planting trees and not knowing what to do with my life. And I finally went to journalism school in 98 or so, I think it was 98. And my first job was at the Grand Forks Gazette, the little town of 5,000 people there. And my my now wife came with me. We were there for a year, went to Toronto for a few years. Uh, she's now a naturopathic doctor. And we came back to, came to Chilliwack. We always wanted to be in BC because it's just better than Ontario. Um, so in 2006, I arrived at the Chilliwack Times and I've been here ever since. So that is now 18 years as of June, actually. I spent a decade at the Chilliwack Times. In that time, we had four owners. Uh, Canwest Global uh, owned the paper until the industry kind of hit the first iceberg in the 2008 global financial crisis. Um, 2009, Canwest entered bankruptcy and sold to Post Media, which was formed for this purpose, to purchase it. Um, and then Glacier bought it from, Glacier Media bought it from Post Media. And then 2014, Glacier and Black Press traded newspapers in the Lower Mainland such that uh, Black Press owns every paper on my side of the Portman Bridge <laughs> and every paper on the island, and Glacier owns all the ones surrounding Vancouver. So it's not, I don't know if it's collusion or what that is, but whatever, it's what it is. The industry is shrinking and it just made sense. Um, when when they bought the Times, of course, Black Press already owned the Chilliwack Progress, which was the oldest community newspaper, is the oldest community newspaper in BC, started in 1891. Uh, 
Uh, so when they sh they finally did shut the doors of the Times at the end of 2016, and I 2017, I went over there and joined that team as a. And for the next three years, I wrote you know hundreds and hundreds of stories. I kind of stirred the pot a lot. I I, I did a lot of crime and and um, court coverage and got a lot of page views, and and they, you know, they liked me. Um, the in 2019, the editor retired. And they couldn't replace them. They couldn't find anybody to replace them. I don't know what it was like in the industry. So six months later, I said, I need to be, I will be the acting editor. I should be the acting editor, is what I said, in their newsroom of five. And the publisher agreed. So I sort of took that over. And then March 2020 hit. And I think we all remember what happened in March 2020. Um, and basically, literally March, the week of March 16th, the economy just went down. Newspapers went into a nosedive. It was it was horrible. It was it was they lost everything. They went down to one one paper a week for two, and uh, and then I was kind of strong armed into taking the job of editor because um, they wanted to lay off somebody in the newsroom and they wanted to lay off the sports reporter, and the union said no 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 no, this guy's got the lowest seniority. You have to lay him off, and. Black Press knew they couldn't, it's not to be arrogant, but they literally couldn't function without me in that newsroom because I was doing the pagination, I was running the paper. So they just forced me to be the editor. So I joked that I got strong on into a raise and a, uh, and a promotion, but I didn't want it because I really liked my job and I wasn't sure I'd still be able to do it. And, uh, and I, and I, and, but I did continue to do it to the point where then the union filed a grievance against me. Um, that the company fought all the way to 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 to, a, to the end to a legal decision because basically they filed a grievance saying I was writing too many stories as the editor, which of course if anyone knows anything about labor law, that's that is a manager doing bargaining unit work. So you know there's an argument there, right? Except for that's not a normal industry. Like there's we're not making widgets. There's no finite amount of things you can do. I can do it was an infinite number of stories to be told if you have time. And, but anyway. Company lost, actually. We lost. We lost that fight, so that was interesting. Um, but they had a the company had a love hate relationship with me because I did I did a good job and I won countless awards over the years, including general excellence for the paper and personal awards. Um, but I I tended to do that by often stirring the pot and being controversial. And you know, good journalism can rankle people, people in power, people of influence, uh, people who spend money on advertising. Um, and you remember the community newspapers, uh, the land on your doorstep are, of course, for free, uh, make all of their revenue from advertising. At least they used to. They make a little bit now online. Um, but, of course, as has been said before, if you're getting a product for free, you are the product. So advertisers pay for readers' eyeballs, right? And so, you know, you can only be so controversial in a community newspaper because, you know, you're supposed to be making everyone happy and not rankling thing. So there are many times over the years when I irritated the wrong person, uh, you know, former, just former MP um, and cabinet minister, people might remember Chuck Strahl. Um, he, uh, he really disliked me, but it's something that he artfully hid for five years because he acted like a beam of sunshine right up until election night 2011, when his son Mark Strahl was crowned, I like to say, MP. Um, and I don't know if he was tipsy or what it was, but I arrived at Mark's post-election party and showed up to get comments and take a picture, and he just tore a strip off me. Uh, and it kind of surprised me, and I could see the look on Mark's face, the new MP, and he was, like, really embarrassed. So anyway, which hindsight, I thought that was pretty funny. But but so, you know, you, you do that in the community. Um, maybe he didn't hate me all along, but the, the stories we did on his controversial nomination process probably hurt the whole family, so... Others like uh, liberal MLA John Less, uh, who who people might remember again, he was in cabinet, solicitor general for a while. Um, he similarly clashed with me. We kind of had a weird, weird way we got along though. He wanted to, he used to take me out for lunch and I didn't know why, but I think it was keeping your enemies close or something like that. But I was like, I'll take a free lunch. I, you know. um, but when he was caught doing shady land deals with a corrupt city official, uh, the province hired a special prosecutor to to uh, see if charges were warranted, and my story on page one of the paper under you know a picture of him was a big bold headline was under a cloud. And I don't think he liked that very much. So, um, 
but I wrote op-eds over the years with strong opinions, stirred the pot intentionally sometimes for the sake of public discourse. Um, but the rise of social media um, really impacted a lot of people and the medium, uh, it's not an excuse on my behalf, but it really turned toxic in a lot of ways, I think, as we all know, especially those of us who didn't grow up with it, it was it was had a relative newness to it. Um, John Ronson's book, uh, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, is really interesting, where he addresses how examples of sort of virtual mobs who formed online to just destroy people who said things they shouldn't or or out of context or what have you. Um, um, one example, this is maybe warranted, but I think that, that NFL kicker Harrison Butker, who said some terrible things about women at a commencement speech or something like that, you know. But in these virtual sort of lynchings often end up in, with real life consequences. So so what happened with to me, to what didn't happen to me, I'm just saying is, is that on June 1st last year, there was a three-year-old boy who fell into a lake. I don't know the details, but 911 was called and all these, everyone showed up. There were search and rescue volunteers who showed up only because they lived there. It wasn't a search and rescue moment and then usually police fire are the, often the first ones there ambulance last they're the most important but they're often last and off to the hospital where he was treated by nurses and doctors and you know these are these are the heroic people who help keep us safe protect us hold our hold our hand heal us their neighbors our friends uh it's a cliche i guess but they're heroes and i've always been a bit of a cheerleader for all of them um so when i saw this twitter feed about the specific topic that was fed, filled with people commenting on what happened and discussing how they needed to pray, everyone needed to get together, pray and create a prayer chain and, and say to help the boy. And that's what's gonna help the boy. I kind of, <laughs> it irked me, let's put it that way. Um, and I'll, I'll read you my two tweets just, just to be completely honest. Well, there was two more, but they were their responses, so it's complicated. My first tweet was, uh, you know what does absolutely zero to help a toddler who might die because he, she is being attended to after a drowning incident at Cultus Lake? Praying, nonsense. Instead, let's support our Chilliwack firefighters and paramedics and RCMP officers and search and rescue members. Um, now, now that I say that out loud, I probably, if I'd stopped there, I probably would've been fine. <laughs> Cause then my next tweet was, I really hope this little boy is saved by the emergency responders who are the only, all caps, ones who will do so. I'm somewhat mortified by the ridiculous prayer posts as if that's a thing. It is not a thing. Stop it, FFS. I think you know what that stands for. So it was, it was rude and it was ill-timed. Uh, next day I went to work, I had a chat with a publisher who was a friend and a couple hours later I was in her office on a video conference call with the head of HR and the COO of Black Press and the group publisher, and I was fired with cause. So about an hour after 17 years of employment, I cleaned up my desk, computer was taken away, benefits ended, it was all over. Reporters were shocked. Uh, my reporters who worked for me were shocked. They were like, uh, except for the one who hated me and filed that grievance way back then. But it's okay. um, and then next came like the social media tsunami. Like it was, it was hilarious. Like it was, um, I had a lot of very positive response, but some of the early, loudest, earliest voices were really, really angry stuff. Like there's a couple of my favorites on the draft. Teal will know these because they're on the day I put them in the beginning of little sections of my chapter. And one of the very first one was uh, from someone named Stuart Joseph. It was a direct message on Instagram one day later. And it said, I'm glad you got fired, you goof. God did that to you, you fucking loser. Okay. Uh, and another one, I, another one I like, same day actually, it was an anonymous direct message. Heard you got fired, you fucking communist piece of shit. Well, I was praying for that, so I guess prayer is a thing, FFS. So, so <laughs> that was the start of my feedback, <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, I did, I did, I did get mostly support from people I knew. Ironically, the more angry it was, the more anonymous it was. Maybe that's not ironic. That's just the reality of communication, I guess because people closer to me, and then even people, religious people who do me, like there was this woman, Tamiko, who is an evangelical Christian. I know it, I've written stories about her and her, um, she does horseback riding for disabled kids. And, and, and her husband actually was one of the conservative candidates that wanted the nomination, Mark Strahl got. Um, maybe that's why she likes me, but anyway. But she was she was very upset that I was fired. She, she understood what I said and knew what I said, and she was very upset about it. Uh, literally, 
actually last week I was at a grocery store and uh, one of the crown council in town who I've dealt with a lot. She she called out Paul and she I, she she's a Catholic. I know she's a Catholic. She pointed that out because her husband is very involved in the church. Uh, and she's told me I was her hero. <laughs> and I said, well, that's hyperbole for sure, but very sweet. Thank you very much. Um, so there was a lot of very positive stuff, but, you know, it uh, it. It was tough. And then with two days, I was within two days, I was contacted for interviews by the Vancouver Sun, uh, CBC, Vancouver's morning show, the early edition, uh, Rebel News, a Punjabi radio station wanted me for a call-in show. Uh, I, I, anyway, I declined the early edition because I knew, I didn't think it was in my best interests. And, and I love Stephen Quinn. I've been on his show numerous times, but I just, I, I don't know, I didn't want to hear, he, he's a He's a great guy, but he's a scary interviewer. If you're here, <laughs> and it didn't, I didn't think it was in my best interest at that point too. Um, same with the radio station. Although the radio, the Punjabi radio station guy, had contacted me later to say that he did the show, the call-in show anyway. And of all the calls, apparently I had sixty percent support. So I thought that was pretty not bad. <laughs> um, however, Cheryl Chan at the Vancouver Sun and Drea Humphreys at Rebel News both told me they would do a story whether I commented or not. So I did. Um, uh, I probably should have been more diplomatic with my comment to Rebel News, but I hate them so much that I just, yeah. Anyway, um, but when my story was told properly in context, as the Sun did, or Sun, I shouldn't say the Sun, because it's actually post media, Sun and Province ran it, um, or told kind of maliciously by a bad actor like Rebel News. The overwhelming sentiment after that was sympathy, actually, and, and anger about the situation and, and, and silliness about it. And like I said, what I said was rude and sensitive, ill-timed, um, but I don't think much more than that. And it was also true, as all of you <laughs> know. Um, uh, I mean, I, and I was just thinking, I like to, I've been watching a lot of comedy lately, and, and I was just thinking how, like, Ricky Gervais spent the last few years of his career on Twitter saying exactly the same thing I said. <laughs> like uh, he was on a show, what was it? He, uh, the Jerry Seinfeld show. He said, what could be more arrogant than praying to a God that didn't stop the Holocaust, hoping he'd help you find your car keys? <laughs> so that's my prayer, uh, you know. And then came the lawyers and people... People, you know, people came out, an old an old uh, colleague at Post Media, his wife is a labor lawyer, and they sat down and they talked and said, absolutely the case. She didn't think she could take it. So, you know, anyway, someone took it and it was, uh, it was amazing. But um, the, um, the, 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 again, to the, the Dutch Mafia, I, I can't even say Dutch Mafia a lot because he always said it as, it was always a joke. Like, it's just this pejorative, it's either pejorative or you're just joking. Like, oh, Dutch Mafia, that's what, you know. But, you know, um, it, it's kind of silly. The, the piece I wrote so far for Teal had started with an, an odd interaction, an anecdote I had with former Socra at MLA and cabinet minister John Jansen in front of a Donair shop where he, I was walking up, he was sitting in the passenger seat of a pickup truck and he looked at me, he smiled, and he looked up and he pointed at the sky like that. And I was like, what are you pointing at? What are you... <laughs> And I, that was literally the entire interaction. But I mean, he he's, you know, if there's a Dutch mafia, he's the godfather. He's very religious, socially conservative. He's wielded a ton of power in this area, literally since the 1970s. Maybe not anymore, but he did. Um, and if John Jansen was the godfather, John Lass is the uh, consigliere, I'd say. Cause he, he, they ran together on city council in the 1980s and got on council. Um, but he, after that, uh, incident. John Les claimed he was vindicated after that special prosecutor concluded there wasn't enough evidence to get a conviction. And of course, he wasn't vindicated. It's <laughs> In fact, the city's approving officer was charged with, with what he did to subdivide ALR land for John Les illegally. Les didn't lose a step, though. He remained the man you had to go through to this day. You had to go through him if you want to be a candidate for the BC Liberal riding in, in this area. You have to go through John Les. He's um, he's the guy. So he remained untouched. Um, but an, an anecdote I want to tell on the other side of that is related to religion, frankly, is, is former UFE um, criminology uh, professor John Martin, 
uh, a very conservative guy. He actually tried, wrote, tried to run for the BC Conservatives. He used to write a syndicated column for Post Media when we were of Post Media, so it appeared in our paper. I used to curse his name under my breath because he really conservative guy. Anyway, he became the MLA as a BC Liberal, and I forget the year. Um, uh, not long after that, uh, his constituency assistant, Desmond Devnich, was convicted for stealing more than $100,000 from the office accounts. I covered the case closely in the newspaper, obviously, and, and, and the usually confident, almost arrogant John Martin was shocked by the response in the community. Um, after the six-figure theft was made public, the community message in general was, oh, poor Des, what will Desmond do now? And John was like, what? He just, <laughs> um, city councilor Sue Attrell um, took him under his wing, hired, he was hired by the local BCHL hockey team and soccer association for marketing work. Attrell then hired him at the uh, hospice society where she's director. I saw him manning a tourism chalet in, 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 in November. Um, so what happened? Well, Martin is a staunch conservative, but he likes beer and barbecue and classic rock, and he is not a Christian. Devnich is a devout member of the Chilliwack Alliance Church, the largest of many very large churches in Chilliwack. And he sings on Sundays. He would sing the anthem uh, uh, at hockey games. And it seems like this, like, again, Dutch Mafia accepted or at least tolerated John Martin because he was an electable conservative guy. Um, but his lack of religiosity meant that when a devout Christian stole more than 100 grand from him, a thief received solace and John was shunned. He moved to Nanaimo, actually. He left town. Um, and, and after I was fired, was fun. he's got a very dry sense of humor, I should say. And after I was fired, we had a couple, a chat, direct message chat. And he said, oh, by the way, there's no Dutch mafia. John Les made that very clear to me the day he told me he decided to allow me be, to become the next MLA. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Um, and there's, I'll, go, I'll do this quickly. There's four elected officials who I went into great detail about in the writing I wrote for Teal here. Um, and I, I think they're worth mentioning just because this, this, this is, we're talking about religion, we're talking about separation of church and state, and we're talking about people who um, just get away with saying, just bizarre things like I grew up in a very grew up like agnostic household and atheist and I, I didn't know anything about religion so it's all I'm very naive about it almost um but the fact that these people get elected is just bizarre to me um the four people are would be uh, school trustee Barry Newfeld who I mentioned and some of you might know just because he got so much notoriety for his stupidity frankly um another one is two-term MLA Laurie Thronis uh Mark Chuck Strahl I mentioned and then there's a school trustee named Daryl Ferguson, who is actually a young earth creationist. He's he's uh, he's something else. Um, but um, so Newfeld went from being sort of an ineffectual trustee who was often caught napping at meetings uh, to one who just turned out to be homophobic, uh, COVID conspiracy theorist. Uh, he, he actually just literally was nobody for behind the scenes forever. And then in 2017, he lost his marbles and made this giant Facebook post where he he said he can't sit on his hands anymore, and, and he, he basically he acted courageous in standing up to SOGI 123, which he called a weapon of propaganda to infuse the schools with gender theory. And, you know, we, we've all heard this before. Um, I mean, and as an editor of a newspaper, well, at the time, a reporter, editor later, he was a, kind of a bit of a dream, a dream, frankly, because school board is insipidly boring, given the lack of power trustees have. They're dealing with, like, you know, a $100 million budget, and they have control all over about two percent of it or something like that. Like they don't they, they deal with policy and stuff, right? So anyway, but he gave us headlines a couple of weeks for six years. It's probably you know he claimed uh, Canada's public health chief public health officer Teresa Tam is transgender and, and which is insane. But also, even if she was because of that, we shouldn't trust her. So anyway, he also blamed the WHO for the, the, the anyway conspiracy theorists, crazy, crazy. Education Minister Rob Fleming just lot just just. He constantly loses my marbles at Rob at the very new film. It was very funny. And then and then he called me and one of my reporters retards in a tweet. And he was excoriated in the media for that. And I was I became again the subject of because I had to respond to that. So it was uh he he yeah. Anyway. 
And then another one, again, thrown us on the throne lawyer, it's thrown us. He emerged in a 2012 by-election, having previously worked in Ottawa for Chuck Straw. Before that, many, many years ago, as a, as a youth, he worked for a Soka at MLA. He was then a policy advisor for to Preston Manning, Stockwell Day, Stephen Harper, so all the all the good ones. Um, his father and brother are, or maybe he still are, were our pastors. Uh, but he got kicked out of the BC Liberals, frankly, for being too conservative, which um, is hard to do uh, for most people who know the BC Liberals are very liberal. Um, I, I'd write again in the in the piece about his three strikes. The first one was that he defended Barry Newfeld's anti-Soji comments, which the which Andrew uh, Wilkins, I forget his name, the leader of the Times, did not appreciate. Like he didn't want to back up Barry Newfeld, but he he stood by him. And then second, he expressed his support for um, conversion therapy, which is the pseudoscientific. People know what that is, probably. Uh, and then they they just they want they're holding on him, holding on to him right up to the election, right up to the election, and days before the election. And then he compared an NDP promise to offer free con contraception to eugenics. I and mean, that was I was like, boom, okay, that's it. You're right. It's fake three, you're done. So anyway, that was Lori Thronus. Again, very nice guy. I always got along with him. I remember a Christmas card from him. It just her popped into my mind. It started with like a caveat, like despite the fact that we don't get along. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Right. Interesting guy. And again, Strahl, the story about Strahl was, was, was that, that probably he didn't like me. And this is where, you know, it sounds kind of like almost mafia-like or what have you, maybe royalty is the word. Um, but it was on March 11th. I wrote this down. March 11th, 2011, he told the party he would not seek re-election. March 12th, he's told the media. March 14th, the party set a deadline of March 18th file nomination papers for the writing. Now, two potential candidates in the area, the one actually the husband of the, the woman I mentioned earlier and another guy who was a prominent lawyer in town, they were livid. They were so mad. They were about this timeline. They were like, there's no way, you know, even if you work at, I think one of the guys say, even if you work at a muffler shop, you, you, have, you can't, you don't have time to stop your business and, and organize a campaign. Um, but Mark Straw was ready. I don't know why, for some reason. Uh, anyway, I remember there was a quote I, I liked, a Conservative Party member, political science professor Alexander Mullins told uh, province columnist Michael Smythe that the high public office should not be like a family business where it's passed on from father to son. But that's really what happened there. And, and yeah. And the last one, Daryl Ferguson, who's who won a seat on the Skillick, Chillick School Board, just one term though. Um, he has a PhD in something to do with religion from a university in another country. I'm not, I forget where it is. Um, but he also spends his time, he's got a, a Facebook page, a group, a, a thing he runs called Worldview Studies Center. And basically it's mostly spreading anti-Islam rhetoric uh, and, and evangelical Christian stuff. He does it both online, but he goes, he actually goes to third world countries and, and, and spreads it there too, which is odd. Um, but he he defends any homophobic stance he can find uh, backed by his uh, biblical worldview. He says he also he even defended Newfeld's use of the R the, the R word to insult me, which he then found like the Oxford Dictionary definition of. Anyways, it's, it's just ridiculous. And he literally is, and this is like if I made if I made him up for a for a fictional book, you'd say that's not that's. A believable character, you know, make more. He literally believes the world is 6,000 years old. He has posts on his Facebook page that, like, where there's people doing videos, like, trying to claiming to explain scientifically why they are right and why the world is only 6,000 years old. And it's again, you, you can't make this stuff up. So, um, I mean, these are the extremes in Chile. Let's be fair, like, these I'm pointing out to <laughs> most people are normal, let's be honest, but uh. Um, but everyone who had issues with me during the pandemic or regarding my prayer comments without fail had other issues with me. Uh, and, and the parallels are, are not a mystery. Whereas um, you see like with climate change denier, John Les was like climate change denier forever. Um, and you see with many climate change deniers, they are fervent Christians, basically because I think the concept of that the earth is not ours to do with as we please goes against scripture. So, you know, um, I don't know if anyone has read a, uh, I highly recommend it, but Lee McIntyre's 2021 book, How to Talk to a Science Denier. Oh, I have it right here. Anyway, um, 
in it, he looks at various conspiracy theories in the book, uh, but he kicks it off at a flat earth convention where he, he, he comes to the same conclusion I did. He says, and this is a quote I, I, I copied down. It says, even though very few Christians believe in flat earth, almost all of the flat earthers I met were fundamentalist Christians. While they do not seem to rely on their faith as scientific proof, proof they did seek empirical evidence that would make all of their beliefs, both spiritual and worldly, consistent. And it must be said that most flat earthers seem to embrace their views with a fervor that was tantamount to religious conviction. So it, it's just an interesting parallel with, with a lot of the conspiracy theories uh, uh, that they tend to be religious people. So um, anyway, and uh, I'll just I'll wrap up real quick here. I just was going to say, and I, I think I've said it a couple of times that a little bit of it's unfair. Like I'm, I'm characterizing Chilliwack because it's not, it's not like this. Like I say this all the time. In fact, I, I don't have the stats now, but I took a deep dive into Statistics Canada um, numbers on on Christianity or whatever religion it is. Not just Christianity, of course, in in cities based on CMA or CA and Statistics Canada. And like, it's literally no different in Chilliwack than it is in like Coquitlam or or Nanaimo or Victoria. Like it's not. Not any, and that's because it's changing. Uh, and I don't have the statistics to back this up, but like I saw, I, I just saw this, so I grabbed this anecdote, which was actually a Scottish, uh, the results from the 2022 Scottish census, which were recently released. And for the first time ever, a majority of citizens, 51.1% declared no religious affiliation. So like specifically, that's 2.8 million of Scotland's 5.5 million people cited no religion. And that number was 24% in 2001. That number was 39% in 2011. And that number was 51% in 2022. So, I mean, I always say that things happen. I was, I'm was i an optimist. I think the cup is half full. I, I think throughout history, we have moved towards progress and, and more positive thinking. And, you know, we don't, you know, we do we, we, we maybe aren't good to criminal to people who commit crimes and, and, and had terrible upbringings, but we don't draw and quarter them anymore. We don't hang them anymore. We don't, um, you know, in every area of every area that, that probably a lot of people on here feel we should make improvements is infinitely better than it was a hundred years ago. And that's not bad in the, in the history of human existence. Right. So, um, um, yeah, and then just one last sort of anecdote that I wanted to tell. I told Ian and, and Teal because I had to tell somebody and I didn't know who to tell because it was hurting my brain. Um, but a friend of mine uh, who is actually my next door neighbor, she is a doctor. She's a medical doctor. She often works in the ER. Um, and just this week, she told me, she's, I can't remember why I was talking to her about whatever, our dogs are sisters, actually. <laughs> and we were talking about that. And um, she she prefaced her anecdote with the fact, the reminder that she is Christian. And I know that because they go to church every Sunday. They're gone to church every Sunday. And she even told me even further, she even believes in the power of prayer. She she claims she's seen prayer create things happen in real life. And I'm like, okay, awesome, whatever you say. Um, but she's a medical professional and she believes in science. And she was um, really upset about something that she she saw and heard. And that was that the day the three-year-old fell into Cultus Lake and nearly drowned, when he was found and taken out of the lake, um, my doctor friend told me that for more than five minutes, no one performed CPR or attempted any resuscitation on the little boy. And what were they doing instead? They were praying. And I just, I just can't believe it. <laughs> So that's that's all I got for now. I could speak I could speak for hours since I started writing this. Like I said, Teal told me to make it more ethnobiography. I just I think I gave him like eleven thousand five hundred words, and I was like, sorry. Uh, but it, it reminds me of the um, like I'm an editor for a living, and uh, I, I constantly cutting people's writing down or whatever. And it reminds me of the famous Mark Twain quote, which is famous Mark Twain quote, which is a. Uh, um, I, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one instead. And 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 it is true with writing; it's easier to just ramble on. But uh, Teal will help me kill my babies, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>